Hi, I'm Susan Weisbauer, co-author of The Well-Trained Mind. And I'm Susanna Jarrett, editor at The Well-Trained Mind Press. And we're talking about education for all parents and for all children in all sorts of settings. So we are so excited today to have Julie Bogart of Brave Writer with us. Uh, Julie is the creator and owner of Brave Writer, which we're going to spend a lot of time talking about today. And she's also the author of two great books, uh, The Brave Learner, Finding Everyday Magic in Homeschool Learning and Life. And then I think that your most recent one is Raising Critical Thinkers, A Parent's Guide to Growing Wise Kids in the Digital Age. That's right. Hi, Susan. Hi, Susanna. It's great to be here. Julie, you and I have known each other for a really long time. I know. <laughs> I still remember when I first met you, I was so in awe of your work that I actually was a little shaky. And you were so immediately friendly. And that really kicked off a great relationship. Well, we we sort of we connected on a personal level. We definitely connected on the level of our real goal here is just to get kids to write. And then um we, we sort of cemented our friendship with an unfortunate occurrence. <laughs> Indeed, that's true. Yes. So I'll tell you what happened from my point of view, and then you can add whatever detail you feel comfortable with. You and I at that time were both on the conference circuit. I am much less. Do you still do conferences, Julie? Very few. I, yeah. I do a few, but I'm very selective. Well, they're very exhausting. <laughs> yes. <laughs> the older you get, the more exhausting they are. Uh, so anyway, we but at that time, we were both traveling pretty extensively. And at that time, that was sort of in the rise of the great homeschool convention network, where these big conventions were coming in. And I know there was a lot of complaint from smaller local conventions that they were driving out the locals. But when they started, they seemed like a very you know, sort of broad-minded, inclusive, yes. you know, this is great. Let's get as many homeschoolers together as we possibly can. So I remember being really excited about being there. Actually, the person who started the great homeschool conventions is from Cincinnati, and he was a part of the network of homeschoolers that I was a part of. And when he first came to me, he invited me to participate on the grounds that it was an inclusive experience. And even at the time, I had already gotten in a little trouble in some of the more very sort of staunchly fundamentalist homeschooling circles here in Ohio. So I said to him, I said, I really need to know that you mean that because mm -hmm. it will be hard for my business if it turns out you change your mind after I begin. And he said, oh, no. And he marketed it as an inclusive conference. So that was how it started for me. Ah, foreshadowing. Indeed. <laughs> a, a literary device. Uh, well used, Julie. Um, so so we both went to the great homeschool conferences for, as you say, you're Cincinnati based. So that was yes. your local conference. And um, I can't remember if it was two or three years into the, but somewhere two, two years, two years into the, into the growth and the, and the growth of those conferences was just huge. You know, they Truly. just got to be so enormous. You were abruptly and impersonally disinvited uh, for expressing some theological and cultural views on your private blog, which you ran under your private name, not your professional name, which had nothing to do with Brave Writer, nothing to do with anything that you were you were teaching. But clearly somebody saw it, raised an objection. And the next thing we knew, you were out. Just no and and no, no direct approach, no explanation. You were just out. Right. In fact, when I had my business consultant at the time reach out to the GHC by phone because they weren't taking my emails or calls, he thought, well, perhaps they just ran out of booth space. It was my own customers who told me, hey, you're not on the website anymore. And yeah. I thought, wait, I, I, I am. I'm supposed to be going. So when he called, he asked, is there booth space left for a writing program? And they said, yes. And then when he said that it was Brave Writer, they said, I'm not allowed to talk to you. Oh, so geez. this oh, Yes. Wow. So this was very ominous. And Susan, it's at that point that I sent you a Mayday text. I'm like, is something going on that I don't know about? <laughs> Well, and I hadn't known about this until this point. So I called the organizer who actually took my call because I don't think he knew what I was going to ask about. And, <laughs> and and that's when I found out that the reasoning was indeed that, you know, you were too progressive and too liberal to come and talk about writing. Mm. And I was absolutely furious. I mean, I, I still have the emails I wrote saying this is not a Christian way to approach a dispute. You know, this just freezing mm. out. And that was sort of the beginning of the end of my relationship with GHC. Um, I just felt that was, first of all, so unnecessary. You know, 
We got disinvited from a conference this summer, Julie, you might know this, um, not because of any of the materials that we were taking, but because of The History of the Ancient World, which is a book for grownups published by W.W. Norton, in which it's pretty clear that I don't ascribe to a young earth timeline. Oh, my gosh. Oh we my were going to have... I know the book wasn't going to be anywhere near the booth, but because of that, the organizer said, and I think this is a direct quote, we cannot expose our parents to this kind of thought. So like this intense protectionism of grownups, I mean, it, it, it was just insane. Well, and I think in my case, and I remember hearing that about you, by the way, and thinking, my gosh, have they not learned their lessons? <laughs> you know, I keep hoping that they will. But I think in my case, part of what was going on is that there had been a big scandal in Cincinnati around the young earth versus the old earth creationism. Oh, really? Yes. Mm. And there was a big um, rejection of the founder of the Creation Museum at that time for violating GHC standards. Of course, I was unrelated to all that. But what filtered back to me, because I have connections here, is that they were just doing a sweep to make sure no other controversies broke out. And apparently I was in that sweep, but I might have been one of one. I don't know anyone else who was disinvited. I haven't mm. heard of anyone else. So yeah. anyway, so the, the, and, and Julie, we're going to have you back on to talk about homeschool world generally. It's such a fascinating topic. I would absolutely love to do that. And that will be a long show. <laughs> that will be a long show. We'll give ourselves plenty of time for that. So the, to, to wrap up quickly, so we can actually talk about writing, I invited you to come to my booth with your materials. This is what truly cemented our friendship. I had all these people already registered to yeah. come because I was uninvited and they couldn't get their mm. money back. So Susan offered me, you offered me a corner of your very beautiful, well-trained mind booth. And all these sweet little brave writer moms came over and were like huddled in our little corner <laughs> talking, you know, and it was just the most generous act I've ever experienced from a colleague. I mean, it was so meaningful to me. What I've loved about knowing you, Susan, all these years is you've been sort of a light of somebody who is really willing to stand in your belief structure and take whatever comes. Mm -hmm. And that for me has been a really great role modeling. And then you've extended this wonderful colleagueship, friendship. During the COVID era, you know, we threw together a conference in a week and you just oh, jumped so on fun. board. Oh, it was so much fun. And so that's the kind of spirit that I really like to see in the homeschooling space. So here's my other favorite memory of you, and it will segue perfectly into our writing conversation. We were at a conference together for a charter school in Sacramento, California, several oh, yeah. years ago. And we got up to have breakfast together. We were like at the same hotel. And you said, you know, why I'm excited today. And I said, no, no, why? And you said, because we're going to present two different views of writing and confuse everybody in this entire <laughs> conference. And I cracked up because I loved that energy. I loved the idea that we were telling parents, make a decision that's right for your kids, mm -hmm. not let's indoctrinate you into the only one right, true way to do anything. Mm. Well, I'm and and I think this sort of lines up with my approach to, you know, belief systems. I'm firmly of the opinion that if you are doing something that is good and valuable, it will find an audience, it will find the right audience, it will find the people who need it, and you don't have to you don't have to wall out other people's systems. You don't have to build hedges around what you're doing in order to keep it safe because it's going to stand on its own. And, you know, there have been, and with writing in particular, writing is such, people don't realize how complicated writing is, how complex, particularly people who are natural writers. And I do think a lot of homeschooling parents, like a lot of writing teachers, tend to be natural writers. Mm. Um, otherwise, they wouldn't necessarily have the confidence to get in there and do this educational thing. And sometimes they just they don't understand what's going on in this little weeping brain in front of them. And so there have been numerous times where a parent has come to me and said, we're working on writing with ease or writing with skill. And my child keeps crying. And I say, go look at Brave Writer, because this is not the right approach for that particular kid. So um, why don't you take a few minutes and explain sort of the basic philosophy of Brave Writer, however much detail you want to give us. And then maybe I'll, I'll come back and say ways in which I see important differences. Oh, that would be great. So the premise for my work comes from professional writing. My mother is the author of 71 books. I grew oh, I up didn't around know that. Wow. Yeah, that's amazing. Oh, cool. 
Yeah, I've grown up around writing. And as a child, I started writing really simultaneous with reading. I have mm-hmm. millions of storybooks and journals. My grandmother gave me a lock and key diary in fourth grade and sent oh, me I on a lifetime <laughs> of writing. Yes. And so I felt very supported. My grandfather gave me poetry books. My grandmother wrote poetry. We're Irish, right? The gift of the gab. That's our thing. So as I grew and matured as a young student, my mother was my primary source of support. And her energy really infuses all my work today. I mean, I've built and expanded. She always says, she worked for me for a while. And she always says, that's not what I did. But I I disagree. I would say this. My mother saw any act of self-expression as precious and valuable and worth putting on paper. And my understanding of writing is that the writer lives inside the body. Your hand or your keyboard is merely a device of transcription. So for me, I separate sort of the original voice of the writer from the mechanics at the very beginning so that a child can have the experience of knowing that what lives inside their body is valuable enough to be written on paper or typed on a screen and read to an interested audience. So this beginning could happen pre-reading, right? You could have a five-year-old who's telling you a little narrative about their dog playing in the backyard. Mm -hmm. If you wrote that down and read it back to that child later in the day, they have the magical experience of authorship. And it is authorship Mm -hmm. and being read that drives writers, professional writers, people who think writing is a pleasure. (laughs) So that's the basis. That's where I start. So do do you feel, and this may be an area in which we'll have to disagree, we'll find out. um, Do you feel that every child can develop a love for writing? I don't think anyone has to. What I (laughs) hope they'll develop is competence and confidence because loving writing takes a different kind of brain. Like I would hope everyone could be good at math and perform the math tasks related to their lives, but I don't Mm -hmm. think you have to love math to do that. I feel the same way about writing. What I argue for, what I want so much for adults is to stop being so intimidated by writing. Mm -hmm. I meet them and I'm sure you do too at conferences. They lack confidence. They're worried about even emailing me. They Mm -hmm. think that they Mm -hmm. don't have the chops. So my goal is to take away the intimidation factor to allow young people to get to the point where they're like, I can do this. Oh, this is a writing task that's demanded of me in my job. Oh, I know how to do that. That's my goal. So, I mean, in some ways, there there are some there are some aspects of what you describe that I I mean, I the definitely our writing programs, which are writing with ease is our elementary program, writing with skill is our middle grade expository writing program. There are definitely aspects of that that I think are the same between the two programs. So, for example, in writing with ease, we spend a lot of time encouraging the students to tell the parent what they want to write and have the parent write it down for that same reason of separating yes. out the mechanics from the expression. Uh, We spend a lot of time talking about how when your child tells you something or tells you what they want to write, they need to do it in complete sentences or else you need to complete the sentences for them and have them repeat them back so that they get accustomed to speaking written language as opposed to oral language, which, as we know, it can be very fragmentary and um, very difficult. So I would say that in those techniques and certainly in the approach of those early years, we're really not at all far apart. I think maybe where I'd see the biggest difference is you describe the five year old that wants to tell a story. I deal with a lot of not necessarily five, but six and seven year olds who have absolutely no interest in telling a story at all. You know, their little brains just don't work that way. And a lot of times what we do with writing with ease and writing with skill, I I call it my engineer's guide to writing. You know, it's an approach for uh, back up for a minute as a writing teacher myself. And I've said this very often. And as a writer myself, I am convinced that there's like a part of the brain that governs imaginative imaginative writing, you know, imaginary stories, imaginary scenarios that some kids just don't have. Agreed. Um, yeah. And they don't need to have it because mm-hmm. you, can go, like that. you can go through an entire lifetime without ever writing a short story or a poem. hundred percent. So I guess the, the approach in, in, with writing with ease and writing with skill is really focused on those kids who get this like wild eyed look of terror. If you ask them to tell a story or to come up with an imaginative scenario and just say, I, 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 I can't do that. I can't do that. Mm-hmm. The majority of the writing that we see in our classes and use of our products is not 
writing stories. Brave Writer is not a creative writing program. We have creative writing options in Mm -hmm. our classes. But no, actually, I would say where we start is just with first person ideas, narratives, facts. You know, most young children, what I thought you were going to say, Susan, you went a slightly different direction than I expected. What I thought you were going to say is that most kids, especially classically educated kids, are just a storehouse of trivia. They have so much (laughs) factual detail available to them that once you get them going, the mother's hand tires out, right? Like I remember Noah, he could go for pages on roller coasters, you know, their height, their velocity, the physics, like these are the things that homeschooled kids become Mm -hmm. so enamored of. But what I've noticed is that the natural speech pattern of most children by age eight is more sophisticated than their transcription skills enable them them to put on the page themselves. Right. So what mm-hmm. I want to do is not lose the opportunity to mm-hmm. capture that vivid vocabulary, those complex sentence structures that they can't possibly punctuate yet and right. help them get it to the page. You know, we start with this jot it down practice, not where we say, tell me a story. No, we catch them in the act of passionate speech. So Mm -hmm. if your child is sitting there and suddenly explaining to you their anger at the way, you know, Star Wars ended, you're going to just start writing that down and stop making dinner. Just start jotting that down Mm -hmm. because that's when they are most likely to use their best language. I completely agree with you. Some kids value a sense of direction or structure, Mm -hmm. you know, helping them take notes or giving them a sense of direction before they start that journey is useful. I remember reading your book, The Well-Trained Mind, and I was thrilled with your approach to copywork, dictation, Mm -hmm. oral language. Like I have notes in the margins of those books saying, she sees it like I do. Like that was one of my ways that I knew your work was really meaningful to me. And I was coming out of this professional writing background. So it felt really good to have like an educator actually support what felt intuitive to me. So I think you're right. In the early years, there's a lot of overlap. I also really found it interesting when you said encouraging them to speak in full sentences. Mm -hmm. I think that's a really good takeaway for me. I like that opportunity. Like, let's say that together. Let me show you how to complete that thought. I love that. Well, of course, that's one of the, you know, one of the distinctives of a classical education is the modeling for a student before you ask them to do it on their own. And I find that if if a child speaks in a fragment, you turn it into a complete sentence, have you them repeat it back. That's exactly what you're doing. You're modeling for them how to form the sorts of sentences that will work once you put them down on paper. We call that partnership writing in Brave Writer. And one of the things, yeah, one of the things that I think parents miss because of school conditioning, tell me if you agree with this. When you're in school, a teacher will often say, please don't help your student write this paper. I need to know it's all their own work. Right. And that's because the teacher is dealing with 28 students. She doesn't know which words in that piece came from the mom, which came from the student. And so there's this reluctance to have the parent participate too much. But there is no other aspect of a child's life where the parent doesn't partner with the child Mm -hmm. to get them to learn to tie a shoe. You know, we would never say, don't help your child tie their shoe. I need to see if they know how on their own. So when you talk about this modeling and what we call partnering, I think what we're really saying is don't be afraid to help. Show them the way. Be the person that gives them a vision of what it feels like. What are those words? Like, I remember with my own child, we were doing a descriptive paragraph about my guitar at the time, and I must have asked her 30 questions. So what color do you think this looks like? And she's like, oh, kind of like cantaloupe. And I was like, oh, let's just jot that word down on this piece of paper. You know, what does the sound sound like to you? Feel the strings. And we just started having all these questions and I just stirred up the language. So when it was time for her to write, she had all this vocabulary already generated. It wasn't just, okay, write a description of a guitar that's in my case, that's in my other room, that's not in front of your body, right? right? Like at home, we can do that. Yeah. Well, and I think there's another aspect, too, of teachers in classrooms saying, don't write this for your child, which is that most, in my experience, most writing assignments given in an elementary classroom are age inappropriate. Oh. You know, 
They yes. require, they're too long, they're too complicated, and they skip too many foundational steps. So there's kind of no way for the student to get through them except for the parent to do part of the assignment. A hundred percent. Wow, that's so true. Give me an example of what you think an inappropriate assignment is and how you'd make it appropriate. I want to hear you do that. Oh, okay. All right. So let's say second or third grade. And I've actually seen these sorts of assignments brought to me with the parent saying, my kid can't do this. And I'm like, no kidding. They can't do this. So write a two page description of the motivations of the founding fathers. This after they've read, you know, maybe one biography of George Washington and one of Thomas Jefferson. I've seen these assignments and it, you know, how is the kid going to do that in third grade? grade, students in our local school district are actually given research papers to do, oh my where they're gosh. supposed to go out and find sources. And, you know, they're, they're short research papers, but still. So the only way to make that age appropriate is to say, hey, tell me three things you thought were fascinating about George Washington. That's it. I mean, I'm so with you. You can do that, you know? A hundred percent. In fact, one of the assignments that we have in one of our programs is what I call a fact book. But what it is, is it's the child learning how to collect source material, but then they just sort of paste it all together as a collage. So there would be like, let's say you pick sharks as your mini book. Well, now you're going to go look up one interesting fact one expert opinion, one saying, one poem mm -hmm. that talks about sharks. And you're just going to basically copy them into a book and create this little sort of edited collection of information to teach them that sources matter and they come from wow. a variety of places. But you aren't asking them to then take that and put it into some kind of four paragraph narrative with points and particulars. Right. And part of what I really disagree with with early elementary, tell me if you agree with this, I'm tired of everyone asking children for for opinions. Oh, yes, mm. absolutely. Please don't form an opinion in third grade. You barely are <laughs> out of the chute. Like just enjoy finding information. Just enjoy yeah. that there's a variety of sources that don't even agree. Like let's enjoy that stage. It's so short lived in our culture. And, and you know, one of the, I use this one as an example a lot because, you know, we're in I'm I, actually not at the moment in the moment I'm sitting in an RV, but my home <laughs> is in the historic triangle of Virginia, you know, the, the Williamsburg Jamestown, Yorktown triangle. And so there is in our local curricula, there's a lot of emphasis on colonial history. And I remember, I think this was a third grade assignment. One of the, after one of the lessons about uh, colonial history, the student was asked, how do you think Pocahontas felt when she found John Smith, you know, in, oh in the woods? And I'm like, they don't know how they feel when they get up in the morning about their own selves in the right. mirror. How are they supposed to put themselves in the mind? And then they were supposed to write about it. So a lot of times the failure in writing isn't a failure of writing. It's a failure in framing the task so that the student is able to do it. And, and I think that you and I, Julie, are de we're dealing with that problem, that mm -hmm. challenge in maybe two different ways. So in let's just talk elementary for a minute. In writing with ease, one of the things that we do in order to develop writing skills is to take away what I think of as the pressure to come up with original content. Mm. And we do that by giving the students passages to read and then focusing all of the assignments around those passages so that the content is already there and the student can concentrate on the work you know, of, of, of transferring their thoughts to the paper. Whereas I think, correct me if I'm wrong, Brave Writer is much more about sort of like freeing what's already inside the student so that that can be used. That's interesting. I think we do a combination. So in our programs that are focused on literature, we use passages from the books and we do a lot of investigation, a lot of exploration of grammar, punctuation, spelling. Um, and we have what we call these big juicy questions to help them sort of explore the book in more depth. But those are often oral, some of it in writing. I do believe heavily, I think because like you, I, I'm an academic at heart. So I always say, whatever you get in any level of our program is just an extrapolation of what you would do in grad school. It's just as for mm -hmm. the youngest age. Right. So for instance, we have a project where children are set to read multiple versions of the same fairy tale over the course of a month or so. And then from that, they will create their own sort of version of the fairy tale. So that's kind of the way we do it. It's like a cross of what you're talking about. We're giving them rich material. We're giving them time to sort of soak it in. 
think mm-hmm. about it and then put it in their own language. Um, that's like at the very beginning level. And so I always tell parents, you know, fairy tales can be the subject of a PhD dissertation. Right. Like, don't mm-hmm. think this is babyish. Learning to paraphrase, learning to summarize, learning to self-express after you've done research or read multiple versions is the nature of academic thinking and writing. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think we just, we get to it slightly differently. But honestly, Susan, I've always found your approach to writing to be very congruent with my beliefs around it, because Mm -hmm. I think you are a writer and writers know the journey. I'm in the middle of working on a book right now. And um, I'm creating all these notes. I I don't know about you, but I'm like a massive rereader of my Mm -hmm. own writing. Mm -hmm. I sit and I reread previous iterations. I read it aloud. I reread a sentence multiple times. And actually to get a draft started, it's it's this weird journey of where I'll put down a thousand words and then I like work on those words because that's what's going to help me get to the next thousand. I don't just write a 60,000 word book and then I go back to the beginning and start writing again. So what I'm doing whenever I think about producing assignments for kids is some version of that. Like, How can I help them have this kind of liberation, this kind of feeling that you can develop your own writing process? How does that work for you? I don't know what you do when you write your books, but how do you do it? (laughs) Oh, well, when I write my books, what I usually do is write 300,000 words and then cut them down to 80. I really wish I could not do that (laughs) because it takes forever. But, um, you know, I've look, I'm 55 years old. I've written 15 something books. I, at this point, I think I'm stuck with that process. So for, for me, and this is, this is maybe an interesting sort of place where we, we differ a little bit just in terms of our own personal writing process. I need to have so much more material than I will ever use. And then I feel as if I'm going in and I'm carving, you know, like, you know, you know, those, you know, those, um, is it Michelangelo who does the, 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 the sculptures, the sculptures emerging from the rock. Yes. yes. That's how I feel when I'm writing. But here again, another difference. Once I've done that and once I feel like I've got this sort of, you know, nice little statue, I never go back and reread it again. Oh, my uh, gosh. Amazing. <laughs> yeah. So. So, you know, I you love ha- that. Well, you have to. And, and we're both accomplished writers. So right. you have to recognize that kids approach writing in different ways. I guess another aspect of this I'd like to hear you talk about is one of the reasons why we do writing with ease and writing with skill in the way that we do, which is it's very programmed. It is very much you say this, kid says this, you say this, student says this, is because of how intimidated a lot of parents are Mm. with teaching. And as you describe the process of brave writer, it sounds something like a professional writer would absolutely adore teaching. So how do you deal with writing terrified parents? Yeah. So we do try to give them as much support as they need, uh, especially in our online writing classes. The parent in our initial series is always enrolled with the student. And so there is sort of, it's almost like writing rehab for adults because (laughs) so many adults really struggle with confidence. But what we try to do is show them sort of a parenting model. It's it's a Mm. crossbreed between parenting and writing. A lot of parents feel like the best writing instruction is corrective. And what we try to show parents is that's not actually, that's what created you. (laughs) <laughs> the intimidated writing parent. Mm. So what we try to do instead is model for them and help them learn how to give the kind of feedback that helps a child feel confident. So what kinds of questions can you ask? What kinds of things can you amplify and support when you're giving feedback about something that needs improvement? How do you deliver it in a way that the child won't go to tears or feel so frustrated? We use a practice. Do you guys use free writing in Well-Trained Mind? No, I am not a fan of free writing. Oh, um, good. Let's talk about that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so we do use free writing in Brave Writer. One of the things that I find valuable is giving people an opportunity. Maybe it's due to my longstanding journaling habit, but to literally just get used to hooking up the hand with the brain mm-hmm. so that there is a feeling of transcription effortlessness And for me, that comes when you don't have to pay such close attention to making sure the mechanics are accurate. It's not Mm -hmm. to say we don't correct those mechanics later in some cases, but just that sort of babbling like a baby or a toddler does where you just start feeling more comfortable using that transcription device, hooking it up with the ticker tape of thoughts in your mind. Mm -hmm. And I invite parents to free write 
at the same time as their children. So for us, it's a little opportunity for everyone to kind of get on the same page around writing. So why don't you like it? (laughs) I want to know. Well, I think it's I think I think it's much more appropriate for maybe high school and up. I mean, I think it's I think you're right that it's a great parent um, tool. But the thing about parents is that they're old enough and mature enough to have basically figured out the I have an I I have something I'm putting into words. I'm putting words down on paper. And we spend so much time, particularly in the early years of our program, helping students develop that capacity. So the I, the thing that bothers me about free writing, particularly for younger children, is that to me, it ignores the fact that there's a healthy, healthy fraction of writing students who have got to do copy work dictation, copy work dictation, copy work dictation, narration dictation, narration dictation, narration dictation, because the process of getting words from their head onto the paper is so unnatural to them. Mm. Some of this has to do with brain chemistry. I have a feeling some of it for me anyway has to do with, I think I tend to deal with a lot of students who they're not starting out homeschooling. They were pulled out because they were failing Uh. in the classroom. Mm. So I find myself dealing with a lot of residual panic and fear. And when you tell a third or fourth or for that matter, sixth or seventh grader who is an incredibly reluctant writer to free write. There is so much baggage built up about the writing process in their mind. There is so much um, failure, sense of failure. There is so much, but I don't know what to write about, right? That's this panic that blocks them that I feel like you can almost reinforce that, which is why we spend so much energy on here's some content. Here are three questions to answer about that content in complete sentences. Now let's write those sentences down. It's a way of, um, I, and I, I know I'm sure with free writing, it does the same thing. I just, I have concerns about this pressure that so many reluctant writers bring into the process um, and about free writing intensifying that pressure because they go into it thinking, I can't do this. That's a very interesting interpretation. And I also agree with you that there are some kids who I would say have been damaged by the way school has organized it, um, giving them a sense of competence. I remember using graphic organizers with the who, what, when, where, you know, Mm -hmm. and allowing kids to do bits and pieces of writing. Like sometimes free writing feels too free or too contentless. So we do writing down a list of topics of things you really love and sort of narrowing the scope of what's going to show up on the page. But I agree with you that there is a certain intimidation factor for the blank page. And in Mm -hmm. fact, I think this segues nicely to a question I wanted to ask you in this podcast. What the heck are we going to do about AI? The number of people I know using chat GPT, these Mm. students in college, to write papers because they're driven by grades instead of Mm -hmm. by the actual benefit of Mm -hmm. thinking in writing, which is what Mm -hmm. the goal originally was and has been really, in my view, utterly lost. I mean, I taught at Xavier for a couple of years and Xavier University here in Cincinnati, Mm -hmm. and I was sort of mortified by how grade oriented everybody was. So we did a lot of in-class writing. We did writing where they had to meet with me like, and this is before chat GPT. So I'm wondering, what do you think about that? Well, I think chat GPT, so first of all, we're not going to be able to get rid of it. I mean, I, right. I've read it's here. I've, it's I've here. read so many interesting takes on this. And Susanna, I'll, I'll send you a few links. Maybe we could yeah. put them in the show notes. There was the yeah, there's a great essay written, um, and I think it was in the New York Times, but I'll I'll have to find it. I can't swear to that. Um, where this guy who's a professor and and Julie, I too, I mean, I taught university writing for 18 years at College of William and Mary in Virginia, and I I felt the same way about you know students coming to me with these B plus papers and saying I'll just rewrite it one more time if I can get an A and the point wasn't to make the paper better, you know? Right, exactly. (laughs) It was was the GPA. And I I have to say not to tar them all with the same brush, but the pre-med students were the absolute worst about this. Um, And I'm like, it's a freshman English paper, chill. But that wasn't the attitude. Anyway, I think in terms of classroom education, in terms of the model where, look, if you're working with your own kid, this is something you can You can supervise. You can teach them to write without without AI. In a classroom setting, I think the only answer is going to be an almost complete transference to in-class writing assignments. 
Yeah. Mm-hmm. Which, which is actually a really great thing. They have to write shorter, more mm-hmm. organized. They can't just, you know, churn out 20 pages. That's such a great development. One of the things that I used to do when I taught is I would start the class by identifying the key terms that were going to recur in all my lectures. I was teaching a theology class. So we had things like faith, religion, spirituality, the Bible, God, you know, all these terms. And so I would start by having everybody do free rights, two minutes, though, per term on sort of a landscape oriented sheet of paper folded into eight squares. And I would have them identify their own definition before we started and then discuss the definitions and then come up together with a new definition. And then we compared tables and then we compared it to what we found in our books. That's where I wish we would see more growth in writing Mm -hmm. is Mm -hmm. using it to explain explore thinking because AI can never think your thoughts, right? Right. AI might be able to generate a paper based on a bunch of thoughts other people have had. But if you're actually interested in being like a better educated human being, and that Mm -hmm. ought to be the goal, you're spending a ton of money at these colleges, then I'm looking forward to writing being treated as a tool for that, not Mm -hmm. proof that you read the lecture, you know, read the books and listened to the lecture. So that's what I'm hoping for. But I wondered, I, I was so curious. Well, I, I think I think it's going to push instruction back towards a more one on one and a more conversationally based model, which is a, only a good development. So, I think you know, so we too. have we have to accept that a technological advance that happens that seems disastrous is in some way going to be able to point us towards a better way of teaching and a better way of writing. And hopefully chat GPT becomes like Photoshop or, Mm -hmm. you know, Adobe InDesign, where it suddenly amplifies the power of writing. I don't know if it can do that. I'm hoping that's the outcome, but that's my hope. So we don't want to keep you too long, Julie, because we could talk forever and ever, but we will have you back. So as we sort of, you know, as we sort of round this, I feel, I hope that we've given people some sense of at least where to start investigating, you know, our two different ways of teaching writing, which as we've talked about it, I don't think we're as far apart as I would have thought 10 years ago, to be honest. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah. But um, maybe we could end up with this listener question, which I already don't like this listener question, but we'll let Susanna (laughs) ask it and then we can uh, we can talk about it. Well, I've been enjoying uh, just sort of gleaning all of your knowledge and experience with teaching writing for the last 30 minutes or so. But I do want to slip this in because our our listeners sent this in, which was kind of a a catalyst for for reaching out to you, Julie, because I've heard this before. Is the split between left brain children and right brain children or left brain, more analytical thinkers, right brain, more creative thinkers, similar to the split between what works for writing with these versus brave writers. So writing with these works better for more analytical thinkers, brave writer works better for creative thinkers, or is that kind of oversimplifying the problem? You first, Julie. Yeah, I I know why you don't like this question, because the right (laughs) and left brain whole strategy or idea has been debunked in science. I would say that I get misunderstood as being about creativity, when really I'm just about generating thought, generating ideas. I mean, I'm naturally a nonfiction writer. I'm an academic. That's my bent. So in my work, what I've done is I've brought these sort of professional tools into the writing space because I think they create some liberation for kids and parents. But I will say this. I think that the well-trained mind gets mistyped as being analytic only Creativity is needed for all writing tasks, research papers, and poetry. There is no shortage of creativity needed, in other Mm -hmm. words, for each kind. So that's what I would say to that answer. I wouldn't try to categorize them. In fact, here's what I would say. Use a variety of writing instructions. Like, don't just be a brave writer mom. Don't just mm. be a well-trained mind mom. Like actually go out and give yourself the opportunity to experience a variety of ways of generating writing. We all need new sources of stimulation. That's what I would say. Yeah, and and I would add I would add to that first of all I 100% agree and I agree with you that with this right brain left brain thing which is it has a lot less to do with sort of the child's natural way of thinking and in my mind it has a lot more to do with what they need to build their confidence. Yes. Right? Because for me panic like that. is the number one thing 
that hangs kids and parents up. So if free writing is going to remove that panic, then that's the Mm. way to go. If using, you know, if the method that we use, which is read this passage and talk to me about what's in it, um, you don't have to come up with your own ideas. If that's what removes the panic, then that's what you do. If the parent needs a scripted, I say this kid says this because of their own panic, then that's, you know, writing with ease or writing with skill. If the parent needs support, but not that sort of, we call it teacher in a box, (laughs) handholding, um, (laughs) And I don't mean to say for that to sound pejorative because we all need our hands held at certain oh, times. But for you know, sure. if, if they need a different kind of hand holding, then Brave Writer is the way to go. So for me, it really has to do with whatever's going to, you know, there, sometimes I think of these reluctant writers as like they've got this big double barn door in their heads and it's got mm-hmm. this huge red lock on it. Wow. And whatever's going to break the lock. And Mm -hmm. sometimes you got to try one thing and then try another thing. But whatever breaks the lock is the method that you use. And that's true no matter whether the kid is a natural STEM affiliate or a a natural, you know, artist, dancer, pianist. Yeah, I agree with everything you just said. And I do think we want to be experimental. I think a lot of people are like holding writing too tightly. Mm. It doesn't have to be held so tightly. There isn't a right or wrong way. There is only the way that helps you write. So be on the lookout. I always say, check your face. You know, don't <laughs> furrow your brow. Don't scrutinize. Don't look like the lady with the red pen and the glasses down her nose. Play with writing. It's language. Treat writing the way you treated learning to speak with a lot of joy and enthusiasm. I always say we write our baby's first words in the baby book. Do we write the first misspelling? We ought to because that is the beginning of a child choosing to transcribe their own thoughts with as much information as they have. And that is worth celebrating, not fearing. So if Mm -hmm. we can kind of flip the script around what writing growth looks like, Mm -hmm. it should be playful, pleasurable, and unlocking the barn doors. Oh my gosh, love that metaphor. Yep. And I think that is a great place to end, sadly, because I could talk to you forever, but we'll do this again. Susan, thank you so much for having me. I have to say, I just adore talking with you about these topics. So thanks for inviting me on your show. Amazing. Amazing. Thank you both for sharing your writing experience and wisdom with us. I feel like I learned a lot, both about writing and like behind the scenes at homeschool conventions, which I have <laughs> had no, in, no knowledge. Of. Um, and for those of you listening, um, I'll put in the show notes links to Brave Writer and Writing with Ease resources and some of the other things we've talked about today. And as always, please subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. We'd love to hear from you, your thoughts on classical education, home education, school education, or any kind of education that interests you. You can reach us at podcast at well-trainedmind.com. Bye-bye.